Parashat Mitzorah, um, in the preparation for Pesach, Yiratzon, Shalimud, Yela Refua, Tanya Bato de Margalit, Yosef Yair ben Aviv Achava, Harav Sivan ben Sima, Betoch Kol Shah Chol Israel. The night of the Seder um, can be easily defined as the most exciting, memorable moment for the majority of the Jewish people in any wherever they are around the world, in any part of um, life they are, there's something so exciting and so memorable about the Seder. And uh, growing up as a child, um, we would have uh, the privilege when I was uh, four or five and six to do the Seder with uh, my grandfather. There are not many, many things that I remember from the age of four and five, but there's a moment at the Seder um, that walks with me and that sticks with me where I go um, in many, many different places. And that's a moment in the Seder called Maror. Um, the, what would happen is that my grandfather would set up about 25 cups of water. He would take a huge portion of Maror, shove it into his face, start smashing on the table. His face would become many, many colors. Take down all the water. And that is a moment for me that sort of is the climax of the Seder where we got to the Maror. The second time where the Maror became so powerful for me was uh, when I was a soldier in the army in uh, Gdud Lavi. So my uh, Mem the, the main commander, he came up to me around Purim time and he said, Yair, I want you to be the one that's going to give the Seder to 400 people. So I got really excited. I had four weeks to prepare. I made quizzes. I made games. I made questions. I made Dvar Torahs. I made ideas. I made like all these different stuff. The night of the Seder comes. Um, it's about 7 o'clock at night, I'm sitting in the room and there's no one there. I'm sitting around 8 o'clock, there's no one there. 9 o'clock, there's no one there. The Mempe walks in and says, uh, Yair, I gave the guy some free time. Um, now it's 9 o'clock, you have exactly 7 minutes to do the Seder, go. So I'm looking at all my quizzes and all my games and I'm like, okay, I have 7 minutes. Can't do that much. So I just asked all the soldiers, I said, what's the one thing you all want to do? And uh, about 300 out of 400 of them all said, let's eat tomorrow. And again, for them, and like me growing up, that moment of the Mara was so powerful. The couple of questions I had about the Mara is very practical and simple. The first thing is um, a lot of us, after we finish a difficult moment, we sort of want to forget it. We don't walk around talking about it. We don't go around saying, you know, remember before 1948, there were many, many difficult things. We don't really speak about that. We move on to the exciting and great moments. So the first thing is, I would think that if we've left Egypt, Let's let go of, you know, eating and feeling the pain. We can just move on. The second question is, it's a little bit peculiar and weird that we make a bracha. Al achilat maro. We're eating something that's bitter, something that's negative, something that we don't really have such excitement towards, and we're making a bracha. Hashem melech haolam. Al achilat maro. You're making a bracha on the maror. The third question on the Maror is, there are three essential pieces to the Seder. One is called Matzah, one is called Pesach, one is called Maror. At the end of the part of Magid, we say that whoever didn't say these three things, Matzah, Pesach, or Maror, did not really have a Seder. And if we think about it chronologically, what happens is 210 years of exile, of the Jewish people being raped and murdered, and then we have the Pesach, the Korban Pesach, which resembles that we are beginning to leave. And then we have the Matzah, which chronologically resembles the journey into the desert. So if we would think about these three pieces, we would say that Maror comes first, 
because that was 210 years of bitter lives. Then we would do Korban Pesach because that's resembling the beginning of leaving. And then Matzah because that's entering into the, into the desert. But if any of us look at any of our Haggadot, that's not the way it's organized. It says, Kol Mishalo Amar Pesach Matzah Umarol Lo Yatzayi Meaning that we start with Pesach, which is preparing for leaving. Then we speak about the Moror, which is entering into the desert. And suddenly we're like, oh, just remember there was Moror too. But Moror should have been the first, not the last. It happened before Pesach and Matzah, not after. But we say first Pesach, then Matzah, and then Moror. So to reiterate the three questions, the first is, why in the world are we eating the Moror? The second is, why do we make a bracha on it? And the third one is, in the organization of the three main pieces, why isn't Mara the first? Because chronologically it was first, why do we put it at the end? And so the Sfatimet says two amazing ideas about the Maror. He says, Inyan matza'u maro. In those three words, the Sfatimet is saying that there's a certain experience that we have that's based on a guy named Hilal Zaken, who would take the matzah and the Maror and put them together and make a bracha, Allah hilat matza'u maror, and he would eat it. The challenge is that nowhere in the Torah does it say that we have to eat matzah and maror. It says we have to eat matzah, pesach, and maror, yes. But it doesn't say just to eat matzah and maror. And so says the Sfad Emet, V'lachen hilel haya korech matzah u'maror. He would put together the matzah which is resembling redemption with the maror which was resembling galut and exile. Lomar sheha Yeshua, which is redemption, haya al yedei shnei em yachad. Incredible idea. Says the Sfat Emet, when Hilala Zaken put matzah and maror together, he was transforming the maror. The maror was not a moment of exile, it was part of redemption. The maror is not something on its own, it's together with redemption, it's causing redemption. It's changing our perspective on bitterness. And so that was in the year 1898. But in the year 1847, he has one more idea about the murder. And he says, Ki hamirirut shehaya la'avoteinu b'mitzrayim. Haya hachana the Yeshua. This fundament explains that we cannot remove and disconnect bitterness on its own. If I analyze negative experiences on their own, they're negative. If I look at bitterness on its own, it's caused by a sin that you made. And it's something that I want to move away from, it's something I want to disconnect from, it's something I'm embarrassed of. I'm embarrassed of the punishments, of the moror, of the bitterness. It says this, Fatimet, you don't understand. It wasn't on its own. It was part of a cycle of redemption. And on a certain level, the Fatimet through the Maror is teaching us that there are two ways to look at life. One is a linear way. A linear perspective of life means there was action one, and then action two, and then action three. And they're all separate, they're all on their own. Once I was a child, now I'm a teenager, now I'm an adult, and now I'm, I'm an older person. So it's linear. It's age after age after age, and everything's on its own. Another way of viewing life is circular. A circular perspective of life is that nothing stands on its own. Is that everything is part of a greater picture and part of a process. Says the Sfat Emet, don't you dare Look at bitterness in life. Don't you dare look at negative. Don't look at challenges as something on their own. Challenge is a step. It's not an end. Challenge is an opportunity if it's part of a circle. And he says on, on an amazing level, in Breshid Perak Tetvav, hundreds of years before the Jewish people are in Egypt, Hashem appears to Avram Avinu and says, I want you to know your great-great-grandchildren are going to be in Mitzrayim in exile. What did they do? Nothing. Hashem was teaching the Jewish people that exile, Hashem was teaching the Jewish people that challenges, sad and difficult moments 
are not your fault. They're part of growth and part of a process of something greater than that moment. And therefore, if we go back to the questions, we eat maror not to resemble the pain, but to recognize the process. We were in pain, but now we left, but the pain was part of the process. We make a bracha on the maror because we recognize that the maror is not something that's resembling negative, but it's given by Hashem as a present. And the last is, why does Mara come after Pesach and Matzah? Because only after we left and we experience redemption can we look back at the Mara as something positive and not negative. When you're in the negative, it's negative. But after you've been released from the negative, you can look back and see it as positive. Just to finish, I want to quote a small paragraph from Mori Verabi, Rabbi Aaron. It speaks about agriculture. In agriculture, if someone puts a plant, a little seed in the ground, it goes underneath the surface, it's dark, it's lonely, and before it grows, it rots. So says Rabbi Aaron, imagine you're a seed in the ground. You're thinking, they buried me. How could they do this to me? Here you lie in the dirt, it's dark and cold and depressing. Suddenly you see your whole life breaking down as though it is disintegrating. You feel that you are surely finished. But are you? No, not really. You may be rotting as a seed, but you will be reborn as a sprout. My bracha to all of us is that we enter into the Seder with our families. It's very clear that many of us have experienced maror, have seen challenge, have been through negative experiences. But when we're sitting there at the Seder like I sat there with my grandfather, it's a memorable moment. And when I saw with the soldiers, it's a memorable moment because it changes your perspective on how to look at challenges in life. We should all have the bracha with our, all our families at the Seder night to not be afraid of the challenges, to see them as part of a process, and to recognize that through the challenge, we will not only overcome, but we'll grow to something greater than we were before. Shabbat Shalom.